So what kind of country has Kim Jong-il left behind for his son to rule over? One in five children is underweight, according to one estimate. The UN says more than six million people in North Korea need some form of food aid this year. Yet a quarter of the country's spending goes on the military. North Korea's army is the world's fifth largest, with around 1.2 million members. It's already conducted two nuclear weapons tests, and it's believed to have enough plutonium to build up to six or seven nuclear bombs. Well, Hans Blix is a former Swedish foreign minister who headed the International Atomic Energy Agency from 1981 to 97, and from 2000 to 2003, he was the UN's chief weapons inspector. Pleased to say he joins us now live uh, from Stockholm. Welcome to the program, Mr. Blix. Good to see you there. Uh, what is your assessment of where yeah. this leaves North Korea in the region? I mean, things weren't exactly predictable when he was alive. No, things have never been very predictable in North Korea. But, um, of course, any pe period transition is always a bit uncertain. Now, this particular transition has been fairly well prepared, and Kim Jong-un had been anointed already and made a four-star general, etc. So there is no surprise. But nevertheless, there is a new sort of power consortium to come into power. And uh, while the young man hardly can make much of a change in their attitudes, the absence of his father, who had been in power for a long time, might, uh, might make a difference. Uh, he might have stood in the way or stood for something that the others don't want. So I think we're all a little, un, uh, little nervous about what could happen, and the outside world tries to uh, keep a steady course, as we have heard. You talk about the young man, Kim Jong-un, the son who is due to take over. He is an unknown 28-year-old, as you say, uh, with a nuclear arsenal at hand. How concerned should we be? Well, we are always concerned about it. Um, I mean, both Iran and North Korea gives a lot of concern because there are possible domino effects. In the Middle East, as you know, there is a worry that Iranian uh, proceedings might affect Saudi Arabia or Egypt. In the Far East, in North Korea, any more aggressive uh, behavior, conduct from North Korean side might uh, also provoke the Japanese. And there are people in Japan who feel that uh, North Korea has already been quite, so, quite aggressive. And if Japan were to move on to a nuclear, nuclear status, which I think is unlikely, certainly at this period, then the situation could be very bad in the Far East. So we have all the reasons to hope that there will be a diplomatic solution in the stalemate with North Korea. OK, North Korea always a constant on our news agendas, certainly. In your time at the IAEA, to what extent was North Korea on your radar then? It must have been a constant too for you. And did you have any dealings with uh, Kim Jong-il? Yes, yeah, not with uh, no, no, nor with his father. But uh, on the occasion when I was there in 1992, it was his father Kim Il Sung who was in power. But I did not get to see him. I had a very frank talk with the leadership. Um, but uh, at that time, things were opening up, and we were sending in IEA inspectors. But then came the crisis when we discovered that they had not de declared all the plutonium which they had, and uh, so the inspectors were thrown out. And after that, some kind of settlement occurred after former President Carter had been there and an agreed framework was agreed and reached with the United States. And for a number of years, it was peaceful and there were no reprocessing, no further plutonium built. But in the beginning of this century, then it resumed. And they now have shown that they also can enrich uranium. They have plutonium for several bombs and they have a capability to enrich. But what we see also is a, hopefully a new meeting of the six power round in Beijing. Uh, the US and others have been working up to that and I think their, in, their, their attitude will be to try to get ca a calm transition because they were on a reasonably good path le recently. There's a famous uh, cult film that you will know about Mr. Blix uh, called Team America which portrayed uh, him as a <laughs> rather out of touch uh, dictator also portrayed you rather amusingly as well in which you were, you were fed to the sharks. What do you make of all of that? <laughs> Well, if I have any fame, I guess it comes from that film. <laughs> yeah. But uh, the, uh, well, everybody will laugh if some bureaucrat is uh, sent down to sharks in an aquarium at the, at the uh, touch of a button. Uh, but the, the background um, was not, uh, I think, not really uh, conveyed uh, the right 
the right conclusion. Uh, the, the impression con conveyed was that he was a bureaucrat and he demands that they should, they should uh, account for their, their the nuclear material and uh, otherwise I will report on you. And that's when he presses the button and I go down to the sharks. But uh, I think that's uh, somewhat erroneous because a report in the international context can mean quite a lot. I mean, the Korean War in 1950 was reported on uh, by UN inspectors, UN uh, observers who were there, and that meant quite a lot. So one should not necessarily trifle with inspectors, even though some of our reports may be boring. <laughs> all right, Hans Blix, you appreciate your time, your perspective on all of this. Thanks very much indeed. That's Hans Blix from Stockholm. <laughs>